this one fitting, you know, you, know, you come here after a taller person, you have to make sure that you're just. Yeah, I hope um, you can see me and um, thank you very much for this invitation. And also, I can see that you said that I need to deliver a keynote speech. You can imagine how rusty I am. No, no, it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. You can see, you can imagine how rusty I am in terms of making speeches. Because in the world that I've been living in, in the last seven years since I left the central bank, is that you come in and say, I have three points to say, but those three points may last the whole day. Uh, because essentially, what you're trying to do is actually uh, perhaps provide a summary in terms of the direction research is taking, but more importantly, provide uh, perhaps uh, some few uh, lessons that uh, researchers need to take up, or even summarize a project profile that you has li possibly taken you five years. So that is why you find that kind of thing. But I'm back here. And thank you very much for coming me back home. I'm very happy that I can see colleagues that I've worked with for several years. It was historical moments because we moved mountains. But, all, but also, it does appear that history does not want to leave me uh, alone. It is still following me up. So today I'm going to talk about um, an area that I was very, very happy to have been instituted, that is the FSD, and the kind of data that has come through FSD that keep on supporting us. And I worked very well with the, all the networks of FSD and even when I left uh, the central bank. So I've been a friend. But today, let me make some remarks along the lines suggested by the governor and consistent with the occasion today and this is on financial inclusion statistics, uh, so statistics conference that is here in a school that we really uh, admire, that is the School of Monetary Studies under the Central Bank. But the most important thing is uh, to make sure that I start it officially. You, rem you remember the official uh, uh, part of it is to say that I'm very happy that um, I'm here. I want to recognize the governor of the Central Bank Dr. Patrick Jeroge, whom uh, he didn't, if we start talking about our history, it can take another conference. But I'm very happy that we come from far. These days I can see he has lost a bit of hair. But, <laughs> but if I tell you where he started, and of course you know why, why he loses the hair, he has to keep awake. But when we started, we had all the hair around us. But that is very, very important. I'm very happy for what you have steered the central bank, including the leadership and also the intellectual leadership in all the areas that central bank has covered. I'm very happy to, to, uh, to, wait, uh, to also recognize the CEO of the domestic financial sector regulations, the CEO of FSD, whom I've known for many years, including her transformation to come to this, to the Republic, supported us in, uh, supported me and other organizations in different uh, areas. So I'm very happy, Tabani, uh, sorry, uh, Tamara for that. I think I was also su <coughs> surprised that uh, my friend Tavanit was also showing up. Thank you very much, uh, Director General of Kenya National Bureau of Statistics, and we have found some useful insights coming from you, and we have worked together. I was telling uh, the representative of, of uh, KNBS how we have been working together with other people in terms of data governance and data policy in Africa, and that is work that is continuing. And uh, all invited guests, I, I, the, the, part of the biggest pro problem with me is that I can f focus on every institution and even individual and tell a long history because of long history of association. But let me say I'm very happy that I'm here, ladies and gentlemen, to witness this occasion and also to see the competition. I thought we were only doing that at the university. And most people who have gone through my hands at the university know what it means to be in front of me or even working with me. So I was very happy that we have seen the finalists, but those who have been left behind, it's another day we are going to enrich the base, the knowledge base in that area. So for me, it's an honor to join you this morning following the invitation to grace the Financial Inclusion Statistics Conference as your chief guest speaker. And I have also 
been informed that uh, the, the, that I will be presiding over the official launch of the first ever uh, FINA Access Household Survey County Perspective Report and an award of cash prize to the overall winner and that will be to the PhD students. I'm sure they are not part of the AERC. Uh, and if they are not, I'm sure they know the programs. Those are the programs we have launched for Africa, and they are still working very well. And um, they're, 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 that, those winners, for us, they make us proud because they are pushing the knowledge frontier. And the, when you push the knowledge frontier, it means that you inform policy as well, and that is an area that we are in. So I'm very happy that financial inclusion is getting very firm ground in the research arena, but also is going to be very, very important in terms of pushing the, the policy frontier as well. I must admit that these are great, great milestones in the history of financial inclusion space in the country, not only using the, using the data that is provided, but even coming up with analytical capacity to analyze that data and come up with firm conclusions. By the way, because Tavanit was here, one of the things I've used from Tavanit, and there's a paper by Tavanit and, uh, and, and uh, Jack, uh, Bire Jack, whom again are people I know, they wrote a paper and showed that actually financial inclusion has, had drifted uh, a large proportion of the households from poverty. And that's why we started saying we are confirming one of the ambitions that we had, that financial inclusion can be used as a tool for sustainable poverty reduction. That in itself, you can see it's something. So bringing Tavanit here to even award those prizes having read this, uh, this kind of study is actually very, very important. At the onset, let me begin by thanking the leadership of the Central Bank of Kenya, uh, Kenya National Bureau of Statistics, and even the Financial Sector Deepening uh, Trust, FSD, for steering the wheel of financial inclusion measurement in the right direction. 16 years since the baseline survey was, start, was, uh, survey was set, that is, was produced, the first baseline survey was produced in 2006, I was also at the, the team that uh, congratulated those who, who worked very hard that, that particular time to give us a baseline, and we continued pushing for that work. So, but then it means that we have been on that space for a long time. But also let me congratulate the team that has worked around the clock to organize this conference. The ingenuity of taking the research agenda to the universities, but very successfully also coming up with some researchers who have organized research and even PhD students. For me, that is very, very important because we are actually showing the continuation of knowledge generation that can be used for, for practical uses. Uh, and practical policy uh, application. That for me is very, very important. And that gives us some, uh, some important handle in terms of how to use the knowledge generation and the data generated. And that data, data generated is practical because it reflects the lives that we lead and the constraints that we face. So for me, that is very, very imp important. The, the, those present, the, the, the present opportunity is important for, for both students and faculty to, int, uh, to, inter, to interact with the regulators and policymakers and also the industry. And that, for me, is very, very important partner, uh, strong partnership in the world of research and knowledge generation. I've been in that world of research and policy uh, and um, no, uh, uh, world of research and knowledge generation for several years. I never lost it, even when I found myself in the central bank. I pushed my colleagues to also, to also make sure that they participate in it, because I always say that you cannot push a policy that you don't seem to understand. If you understand the policy, then you can, if you understand the knowledge base, then you can pu push the policy to its uh, conclusion. And that's what we have worked on. And we have worked on the fi financial inclusion agenda because we know the benefits, we know the outcomes. And we also know the constraints that most people face below at every level of the pyramid. And so it means that financial inclusion is also using financial instruments in the market, but we can also use that space as policy makers and policy leaders to push for new instruments that are going to make a difference given the time constraint or the time period we are, we are faced in. Ladies and gentlemen, financial inclusion 
It's actually my bread and butter. And uh, the governor said so because I started this work a bit, some bit, uh, some since 2007. We started talking about the failure of financial of uh, the financial sector in terms of addressing the needs that people seem to have, and even where banks are located in places where most people are, are not perhaps could not, cannot access. So in a sense, I've been there. I look back with pride on the decision to approve the Fodacom, Fodacom Safaricom, and Commercial Bank uh, of Africa partnership in delivering financial institutions through using mobile phone that came to be dubbed as M-Pesa. But it was a refraction of retail electronic payments platform that actually made a difference in terms of how the market works. For us, the retail electronic payments platform metamorphosed into a sophisticated and complex web of financial industry. And today, we have seen the fintechs all coming in to actually innovate around that space. But more importantly, we provided the banks with a technological platform to manage small accounts, accounts for people who otherwise would not have bank because their incomes are low, but also irregular in terms of flow. So it means that some of the conditions that are set by financial institutions would not have worked for them. But that is a history we can write, but we, we also do believe, I also do believe that it is a history we can push to the next frontier. And for me, it is very, very important. The first thing is acceptance, and then once you have accepted that it's an instrument that can be used, the second level is how to use it, and the third level is how to apply it. And then from then on, you can also be coping with the frontier developments that take place. So the results include financial inclusion as measured by access. And I can remember from 2006, we were looking at the data. It started off with about 27% 20, of, of the adult population. Now we are at 84%. And I noticed that the governor was telling me that there, was, there has been a bit of stagnation. And then I remembered that we have to understand where we are coming from. One of the things I quote when I talk to people and they're talking about financial inclusion and the bottom of the pyramid is the data that uh, Tavanit uh, was produced by FSD on financial diaries. And that is looking at the, the bottom uh, uh, household set and how they manage their finances. And we realize that they are a very complicated set of decision making that they are involved in, very complicated. I'm not sure we can actually come up with a structure of a model that can, can be tractable enough to follow them. But that kind of complicated more systems that they used in diversity is because of the constraints they face. So in a sense, if you don't construct products that answer to the constraints the bottom of the pyramid face, or let's say at any level of the pyramid, then we are going to be lost. The market is going to be lost people are going to be lost in the process and the market will find that they have missed the boat. And we have seen several examples of that. But for me, the most important thing now is to say that we came up with a, we approved a product in 2007, a product that is able to navigate across all market segments, knowing that in Kenya, just like any other African country, we have market segmentation across everywhere. And the definition of segmentation differed in terms of income, distances, and all that. But if you have a product that can be able or can manage to navigate all the segments of, of the market and also navigate across individuals of different uh, makeups, then it means that it's really a development and a, a success story. And we have lived with that success story and pushed it to the frontier to serve different aspects. But more importantly, we need to, to, to see how it imp it has improved the development of all, and even in future it can be used to push the development of visible interventions that will work in every subsector of the economy. Well, the previous FINAC says household surveys focused more on measuring how the general population access the financial services and products from providers. This became less, less important as technology became the layers under which financial services can be de delivered. 
Today we don't have a fight or even an argument about how to deliver the financial services. Even payments. Even to the government, by the way. Even paying your taxes. You can imagine, we don't have any argument. So it means that we have all been coordinated by that retail electronic payments platform. At one time, I described it as a, dog, a, 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 a tail that wagged the dog. And we continue seeing that. And we are happy about that. So we have seen several FINA accesses that they have given us details. The latest in 2021, household survey that was released in uh, December 2021, and it indicates that the use of mobile money has been stagnating. I was telling the governor that um, we need to go back to the drawing table because we have to live with our own realities. And if you miss out the realities, then you'll be going on your way and the market will be going on the other one. There must be some diverse factors for this stagnation. But one that I can easily talk about is about the way the market produced credit scores. And they were supposed to be used by the CRBs. But for me, the way I understand the credit scores is that you penalize me if my credit scores are declining, isn't it? So you charge me a higher percentage. And if they are improving, you pat me on the back by saying, good. So it means that my, the way I'm pricing your risk is now I need to give you an incentive. So pricing risk means that you penalize those who are destroying their risk rating and uh, incentivize those whose risk rating is improving. That's the way it should work. But it cannot be a yes or no. Then it means you have, the, the people will leave the market, isn't it? That is one of the examples of stagnation. But maybe, Governor, we can come up with diverse ways. But one of the, I, wasn't, I wanted to bring that point home because we have to go back to the drawing board and ask ourselves, why the telcos, and that is those products, especially the, the savings products and, and, the mobile, and the digital reading products created the credit scores or credit scoring was to help us move away from the collateral technology that has punished the, the growth of the of credit market. And even that's why we have so many of those markets attached to that. So it means that we can use that platform of credit scoring to price risk. And then it means that once we are able to do that, then the CRBs should also see what kind of technology can we advise. That is the space we are in. We can come up with so many of them, but I think the credit scoring mechanism was a, a game changer. And then we have to sustain that. But we do know that there are several issues that we really also need to deal with. The beauty about it is that they are not structural. We can actually uh, deal with them with simple solutions that are actually also uh, credible in, in the marketplace. The theme of this conference, leveraging financial inclusion statistics for policy and creation of economic opportunities, resonates very well with what policymakers and researchers in the industry are focusing on. And we have to look at several areas of actual usage the quality of these services and products, and what impact on the individual or even welfare and how it enhances consumers in terms of the, 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 their own environment and how using these services and products can actually improve the ways of life and even improve the livelihoods. We do know that quality statistics on financial inclusion are therefore important, or they, are, they should be very important, and they should answer the questions that we always ask ourselves. But more importantly, they should help us influence policy with evidence-based research, like, that, like, the one, like the winners. Not only the winners, even the others who are in that party. They must have made some contribution. I'm one of those people who believe that your marginal productivity must be positive at all times because if it was zero, then you should be, we should remove you without affecting uh, that overall output. But my experience so far has been seen that most of it is negative. So it means that we prove the actual output when we remove you. 
So it means that those who researched made some positive contribution. I don't want to go into my own semantics of how I define things, but I define them because of a particular reason, something I think we can talk about. We note that this is essential given the changing trends and dynamics in the financial inclusion ecosystem because technological innovations and changing the demographics and even consumer behavior will allow us to design policy changes and even economic uh, outcomes that is going to help us manage shocks that are hitting us. Right now, we have been buffeted by multiple shocks from the COVID-19 to Ukrainian surprise, uh, crisis and supply shocks to food security and climate change effects that are even keeping central bankers awake. I'm, I'm afraid they have to be awake because they are buffeted by supply side shocks and they don't have tools to manage that. But all the way, we know that this is quite problematic. So it's, it's in a sense, having data in terms of interventions that we need to, to, to make is very, very important. I have had um, an opportunity to analyze the 2021 FINA Access, uh, uh, FINA Access Household Survey and the, report that, uh, and the report that was launched in December 2021. And the indicators generated across all the 47 counties in Kenya have, bring, have brought out some unique and challenging effects that you see across different counties. And more focus on the quality and the impact dimensions provide opportunities for researchers and even policymakers uh, to see how they can actually push the frontier and support the, that area and those people who are participating in that market and ecosystem. In fact, this has made it possible to prepare FINA Access Household Survey counter perspective report that we are going to launch today. But I do hope what we, we want, even after launching it, I do hope the county government representative that will be attending or attending this conference and are going to carry that report home so that they can study it will actually help them to interrogate the low hanging fruits that they need to, to wake up and, and, uh, and, and, and pick up that will help drive inclusive growth in their countries. Most of the time we talked about inclusive growth, but we didn't realize that actually a major driver of inclusive growth was also even inclusive finance. Because finance will allow you to save and invest in areas that are going to be commensurate with your income and your sector, uh, in, in the sector you are working in, but more importantly, to give you a chance to actually have an array of assets that will help you escape uh, negative shocks. And we do believe that is where we are coming, fr we are coming from. And um, we do believe that with the counties will help us in terms of understanding that and in, even how we are going to deal with the manifesto of the, of, uh, the Kenya Kwanzaa government in terms of how we can finance micro and small micro, small, and medium enterprises, and how we can promote sustainable finance through green finance, addressing financial consumer protection issues, among others, but more importantly, addressing those who are at the bottom of the pyramid, so that they are not left behind, and uh, we do not also come up with inhib inhibitive product characteristics, and even compliance costs. In business, in business models, which actually provide massive failures if we don't recognize the constraints, and even massive failures in terms of uptake of those products at the bottom of the pyramid. And that is why the government is launching the Hustlers Fund. And uh, the Hustlers Fund is actually an instrument to correct market failure problems at the bottom of the pyramid. Most of the time, we start some good products that will address the pyramid, uh, the bottom of the pyramid. But what happens is that the product leave the, the bottom of the pyramid and move on to the next level. It's very important to move on. But what the intention should be is that people are the ones who should move from the bottom of the pyramid upwards. But the product that was supposed to be an intervention to correct market failure problems or support should remain in that location and it should graduate people up the pyramid. 
That's what we are looking for when we hear about Hasra's fund. I have to tell you, Governor, that I, my phone, which I left there because it keeps buzzing, I have more than 20 proposals of how to implement and to manage the Hasra's fund. I don't want to say they have missed the boat, but I just want to say that they should have waited that we describe the product we wanted to bring into the market. It's an intervention, and you understand the intervention at the bottom of the, um, uh, of the pyramid. I was telling, telling, Tamara, uh, I was telling Tamara that um, when I looked at the data on financial diaries, it tells you exactly what it means. And so it means that you can use even the data on the financial diaries. I hope you can have a, 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 more, a, a more recent survey that we can use. It becomes very, very important. So in, in a sense, what we are really saying is that the data provided in totality can help us construct products that actually can intervene in particular sector of the, of the market or even level of the pyramid. And that would help us in terms of pushing, every, no one should be left behind just because we don't want to impose product characteristics that are not commensurate with the target population that we, we are dealing with. I'm reliably informed that the research work presented in this conference is in the last three days has made great efforts in providing some of the answers to some of the, the, the areas that I've mentioned. For instance, papers commissioned at the deep dives and the university students' competition under thematic areas beyond financial inclusion, role of mobile money in driving economic opportunities, it is it, it very well, by the way, it, I, I remember I had to go throughout the countries in Africa trying to tell them that if we introduce mobile phone-based transactions, we are going to improve the terrain. Some of them did not want even to listen to it, and today they are still languishing in that quadrant, that low-level low quadrant. Others wanted to, to hear more. Others who are captured by the big banks didn't want to hear more, they are still there captured. So it's an area that you have to choose. But what we were trying to do, and this is very important that you, Governor and the team, we have brought this to the frontier, is that let's give you the knowledge base. Let's give you the applications, and let's see how you can use it to influence policy. One of the things when I joined the Central Bank, at least Governor, you found it much cleaner than um, and when I joined in 2007, when I asked how you conduct monetary policy, I was given a lot of answers. Then I realized I, I think I'm in a different environment. This is not the central bank because it's, it's a totally different institution. Because the way I understood monetary policy and even how you can use monetary policy and even how you can conduct monetary policy was to completely different. Because the first thing was to look at currency outside the banking system. What is happening? Accounts in the banking system. Who, whom can we influence? Anyway, that is for another day. But it's very, very important. So we should not shun knowledge generation. The other papers, the other set of papers were looking at the extent to which financial inclusion is an enabler to economic opportunities. Just imagine. Very innovative thinking. Uh, and the, another one uh, is extent to which Kenya's financial inclusion journey has been fair, inclusive, and value-adding. And the climate environmental risks and financial inclusion. And the final one is women interaction with Kenya's financial sector. Very exciting. In fact, I also, when I saw that, I remembered to carry my, the, the case that I had to, when I left the central bank, I had told myself I'm going to devote some bit of time to write a case study on M-Pesa because we don't want it to be forgotten. And because I was writing it in, uh, in uh, Bravatnik School of Government, Public that is government of public policy in Oxford, I made sure that I included a chapter on the politics of policy making in Africa, just to influence that. But what I realized also is uh, the good, my colleagues who are, was very good colleagues, decided first of all to list all the papers that I've done related in this area. And the latest one was on digital technology and state capacity in Kenya, and tells us about regulatory capability and all what I call innovative uh, regulatory technology to cope with the market. 
So it's something that can be read, can be applied. So I'm very happy that we are pushing the, the frontier. And pushing the frontier helps us in terms of coming up with solutions. And uh, those solutions are going to be very, very important. So these are diverse areas. And obviously, the policy issues emanating from that are going to be very important. In addition, the guest lecture to be delivered to, later today by Mr. Asad Alam, Regional Director of the World Bank Group, on which is focused on equitable growth, finance, and institutions. And that paper, the, the lecture is on frontiers of financial inclusion. Uh, is going to be very, very important because it's going to complement these studies and raise the profile of knowledge generation to that level. I'm sure that is going to be very, very important for even not only for the current researchers that joined in, but even for the future activities so we can have a, like a, a, a day where we want to listen to the frontier papers. And that is going to be help, uh, to help us in terms of unraveling what is the value beneath fin access data set? How can we use it improve, in, in terms of improving policy? How do we support the institutions that are working with that? And of course, it resonates well with the papers, with the works that I've been covering since 20, 2017 or so. We have been working on financial inclusion and market development in East Africa. And what we wanted to show is that financial inclusion will be very well segmented by also market development. And we can also show and, rep and, uh, and argue how it can be replicated across Africa. East Africa is quite advanced in, in that. And also, some works that we are also covering at the IDRC support. That one was at the Bill and Media Gates Foundation support. At the IDRC, they wanted to make sure that no one is left behind. Let us look at fragile and post-conflict economies because the first thing about conflict is to destroy institutions so that nobody is left behind. How do we bring that to, 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 to work? So we have a diversity of choices. So I understand there are so many uh, there are very many unanswered questions, research questions regarding several areas, financial inclusion, financial health, nexus, the, rig the rigidity or lack of financial knowledge, rigidity in, the, in some of the segments of the, of the, of the, of the economy or of the market. Sometimes that rigidity may be because of lack of financial knowledge or lack of financial instruments that can be used. So we still have a 5% population that is excluded and we still have to find a way. And this, this kind of data will help us find a way of how to reach them. Is it the products? Is it the knowledge base? Is it income levels? But obviously, everybody would like to save. It's a question of how they can save. Everybody transact. It's a question of how easy it is to transact. And um, we have several issues that have come up. I know I have made some comments in so many areas, including taxation. Now that uh, is going to be my work to deal with that, obviously you're going to see some results in that. I'm one person who believes that you, uh, if, if taxation should be an incentive to the market. So essentially, we can deal with those who are excluded by using the kind of studies that have come in, or even redirect our efforts to addressing those issues, and we are going to get some solutions. We want to make sure that no one is left behind in the digital economy. And once we, nobody is left behind, then it means that once we are together, we can construct products that can cut across economy, but make sure we are conscious about the sectors or segments in terms of population. So I challenge everybody in the room to see that we, this is not, not the end. This is the starting point in terms of where we are going and working together, KNBS, the Central Bank, will also be available in terms of uh, looking at the diversity of those studies, even pushing the frontier a little bit further so that we actually make some practical solutions for those people who have been excluded and enhance those who are already included so that they, they, they raise the flag and keep themselves to the utmost level in terms of influence, policy, and even prosperity for, as I said, financial inclusion is related to prosperity. Let me conclude having said, that's the problem of reading a speech. If you're not reading a speech, you determine when you stop and, and when you begin. But my biggest problem is that I also don't know when to stop when I'm not reading a speech. But when I'm reading a speech, there's a point I will say to conclude. 
So let me actually conclude once more. Let me thank those who have worked tirelessly to make this conference a success. I also wish to thank everyone who attended this conference. And the governor mentioned that there was also a review mission. So you had, even beforehand, you had a thousand people attending because essentially of the importance of that and also the importance in terms of personal development in writing those papers. Um, I believe it has offered a lot of, a lot of uh, satisfaction to everybody. But I also want to commend the efforts dispensed in, preparation, in, in the preparation of the FINA Access Household Survey uh, to county level uh, perspective report, which I do believe that it will give us an idea that whenever we meet governors at the county level, we want to ask the component, where are they in terms of financial inclusion? That's the first question. They give us their own global picture, local but global picture. In terms of the, and then we ask, what are the constraints in terms of moving forward? And then we are able to say, okay, if these are the constraints, we can ask some of the experts to construct products that are going to be consistent with that. Luckily, we have fintechs that are coming up, they are doing virtually everything. I think the latest paper that was published like two months ago by myself, supported by my research assistant, these days I have to use research assistants, it was on fintechs in sub-Saharan Africa and how we can use the platform or the fintechs themselves in terms of mobilizing savings or constructing a uh, platform for savings. So you can see that we can have even localized fintechs to help some counties that feel that they know where they are, they know the constraints and they want solutions. So that is what the question will be addressing the governors and that I'm sure is going to be very, very important. Lastly, I wish to commend the cross collaboration not only among the three partner institutions, the Central Bank, the KNBS and FSD that I've been very, very fr friendly with and working with. And I can also see that uh, the Bankers Association is also closely uh, into that picture. I'm very happy that that part partnership will, will be, is very important for our do domestic financial market development. It's also important to inform the, 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 the financial sector regulators in terms of advancing the financial inclusion agenda, as well as providing a rich knowledge generation in various dimensions of the products we would like to use. So I'll stop there just to thank you that's to understand my appreciation of this. And uh, also saying that I'm always conflicted when it comes to that because I'm a researcher in this area. And I'm also a policy driver in this area. I've been out there working on it. That's why when I start talking about this subject matter, I can continue and continue forever. But I think you understand the passion that I have in this area. So thank you very much and good morning, ladies and gentlemen. And I'm sure this uh, meeting is worth its sort, and we hope to continue in that space. Thank you very much.